Welcome back to our program, Prepare to Meet the God. To the viewers, we thank you all for giving time for the words of God to break the false teachings and conceptions about the ways of God and of His Holy Word. All of these presentations are ministered by God to our lives just to allow us to prepare correctly and faithfully for the soon coming of Jesus Christ in this world to save His people. My brethren, this is the third episode of the Temple series where we will be talking about the origin of the building of temples and what the original Church of God looked like or comprised of from the very days of creation. Previously, we have understood that God's Church, His Temple, His Tabernacle, and His Sanctuary consists of His presence and His people. He was never particular with a location, but rather He considers the proper way of worship, which is in spirit and in truth. Spirit, being moved by the Holy Spirit of God in our well-doing and in the keeping of His commandments, but in the secondary sense, worshiping in spirit. For the Spirit has no flesh and bones, which means nothing tangible that would become the object of our worship. In the days of Christ's ministry, Christ rebuked the teaching that there should be a center of worship, a temple of man's creation that will serve as an instrument of worship. This time, we will understand the origins of this temple building. And so, let us engage in this study, beginning with a prayer for wisdom. Let us pray, my brother. Almighty Father, we come before Thee in praise and gratitude for Your great magnanimity to Your people in this world, for blessings unnumbered, and strength to continue at each day of our lives. Once more, we come asking for the things that we need of You. We ask for spiritual discernment and heavenly wisdom to understand the truths about the temple, even the church that You have in this world. Give us Your blessing of strength and grace to overcome our weaknesses and walk in the light. Please forgive us for the sins that we have committed against Thee, and against our fellow men, as we forgive those who have sinned against us as well. All these things we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. To rehearse what has been discussed in the past, let us read for our first text here in Matthew chapter 18, verse 20, where it says, For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. This is the principle of God, my brethren, and this is how we define His church. It is His presence among the midst of a people who gather in His name and keep the Ten Commandments that stands as the great moral standard that we are to follow in order to become just like Christ. God was never particular of the location or the number of His people gathered in a certain place. He has given to us the great example during the time of Jacob, acknowledging that where he was, was the church of God. For God promised to be with him, and he was God's servant. We read that here in the book of Genesis, chapter 28, verse 11 to 12, and then 15 to 17, where it says, And he lighted upon a certain place, and tarried there all night, because the sun was set. And he took of the stones of that place, and put them for his pillows, and lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed, and behold, a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. And behold, I am with thee, and I will keep thee in all places whither thou goest, and will bring thee again into this land. For I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. And Jacob awaked out of his sleep, and he said, Surely the Lord is in this place. And I knew it not. And he was afraid and said, How dreadful is this place! This is none other but the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. God has taught clearly of what makes up a church. But the question that is to follow is this principle of considering humans as His church. When did this begin? Is it a teaching during the time of Christ when He presented to the people their purpose and their value in the sight of God? Did it begin in the New Testament or did it come earlier? Now, the answer is simple for this, my brethren. As God considers humanity as His church, specifically those who are obedient to His will, then we will understand that the moment humanity existed by the power of God in creation was the beginning of the church of God here on earth. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 45, this is what it says. And so it is written, The first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Adam is the father of our race, so as to be called the first man. And that first man, Adam, was accompanied by Eve. They together were our first parents. But there was something that we need to understand about their union here on earth. Because from there, we will understand that God also made us to 
understand that he is united with his church in a certain institution that he has made, especially on marriage. Let us read here in the book of Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, jump up to 20 to 24. It says, And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. And Adam gave names to all cattle, and to the fowl of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found an help meet for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs, and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman, and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bone, and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of a man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. In the divine institution of marriage, God did not merely proclaim that the union between man and woman is something that should be considered most sacred, but God was to indoctrinate, teach man with the principle of marriage. For this marriage relation, my brethren, is the relationship between him and his people in this world. We can read that here in the book of Ephesians chapter 5, verse 31 to 32. It says, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Adam was made one with Eve, and our first parents at the former part of their lives, the earlier parts, were ones that were united with God. In a spiritual sense, they were wedded to God. God was the husband of his people, and his church was to be considered as his wife. And this is another point to consider, my brethren. The moment that God has declared for him to have a church in this world composed of the human race, in the time that the church was established, was a time where there were no material structures whatsoever, no church buildings in the time of creation, no man-made construction comprised of some pillars, a wall, a cross even, some doors and windows and an altar. No, it was humanity that comprised the church of God alone. But the building of these church buildings and temples did not come without origin. It means it had some roots. We read of the beginnings of this temple building here in the book of Genesis chapter 4, verse 16 to 17, where it says, And Cain went out of the presence of the Lord, and dwelt in the land of Nod, in the east of Eden. And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bare Enoch. And he builded a city, and called the name of the city after the name of his son Enoch. This marks the beginning or the outset of these structures, my brethren. Cain and his descendants built a city. And a city, unlike what we have right now, is defined differently in the Bible. For it is not merely a location where people reside, unfamiliar with each other, just there to take in jobs and to be close to grocery stores and markets. A city in the ancient times was defined more deeply, for the people of a city are closely connected in belief and their works, not merely an economic standpoint. A city is defined here in Matthew chapter 12, verse 25, where it says, And Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. These are words parallel to each other, a city, a kingdom, and even a house. And that house, according to what we have studied previously, means a church. And we can read that here in the book of 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, saying, But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Now, if Cain made a city, was it in any case a city of God? We give an answer to that here in 1 John chapter 3, verse 12. We will slowly understand of the origin of this temple. Not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother. And wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil, and his brother's righteous. Cain was declared a wicked man. And nothing good comes from the hands of the wicked. More importantly, one that is declared as a wicked man is defined by God as someone who rejects and forsakes the law of God. Here in Psalms chapter 119, verse 53, it says, Horror hath taken hold upon me because of the wicked that forsake my law. Continuing from the very time that Cain built a city, a kingdom, a house, or a church, this is what followed. Here in Genesis chapter 10, verse 8 to 10, it says, 
and Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, and Erech, and Akkad, and Kalne in the land of Shinar. The descendants followed the footsteps of their wicked father, and they continued what he began by their own choice. In the time of Nimrod, he built the kingdom of Babel. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord, but that did not mean that he was an acknowledged one in the sight of God. In its original tongue, the word before in before the Lord meant to be against the Lord. We refer that definition in the Strong's Concordance Hebrew number 6440. We continue by narrating the story of the sons of man choosing to go against the will of God here in Genesis chapter 11, verse 1 to 9, where it says, And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone, and slime had they for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower, which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language. And this they begin to do. And now nothing will be restrained from them, which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth. The city, or the tower of Babel, was a church, and it was a church that stood having a material structure to become the object of worship. A church, as what we know, comprises of believers, a set of beliefs, and a God to worship. Nimrod and his people had a belief, and that belief was to go against the instruction of God. For they were filled with the unbelief on the promise that God would never flood the world in such a great scale anymore. They had a God, and it was the might of their own hands, and the tower. For the tower was the instrument that was to save them in the time that a flood was to drown the earth again. And they disobeyed God's command to spread across the face of the earth, to repopulate the world. They clustered in one place. And so God made use of his own power to fulfill his will. And that story ended with them attaining languages of different forms, and they were confused and scattered across the face of the world. My brethren, there is a conclusion deep beneath the story of the Tower of Babel, which is commonly known as Babylon. And it is this, my brethren. Anyone who procures, builds, or creates a temple, a city, a church, a tabernacle to become an instrument of their faith and their religion is a Babylonian teaching. It is not the will of God. It is not His church, and it will in no way become accepted of the God that we serve. Rather, He has added of the description of Babel or Babylon here in the book of Revelation chapter 18 verse 1 and 2, condemning, and after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. This is not the habitation of God, my brethren. The doctrine of acknowledging a building or a man-made structure as a church of God is a doctrine that brings confusion. And it literally feeds confusion to the minds of the people because it removes from the minds of the people the great power of God to be present at any place. And when that happens, the omnipresence of God is questioned and people are confused on where to worship and where to find God. That is why it is most important to study these points to bring ourselves out of Babylon and out of confusion. More to the story was added, the will of God over these man-made structures or church buildings. This was his purpose, intention for these churches. We read that here in Genesis chapter 11 verse 8, where it says, So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. God wants us to scatter, to cease from being a part of these church buildings. If we are in religions right now that teach that we must gather in a certain church and in a certain place, because the sacredness of God and His presence 
is located in that certain church, then we must scatter ourselves from these Babylonian teachings of worshiping in temples, my brethren. Our mission is to return to the true way of worshiping God, a way of divine worship that is not limited by any circumstance just because we need to be inside a church building, a way of worship where we connect ourselves more directly to the God above, believing that He is a God that is present where His people are. We add to the declaration of the original purpose and will of God here in the book of 2 Chronicles chapter 6, verse 5, where it says, Since the day that I brought forth my people out of the land of Egypt, I chose no city among all the tribes of Israel to build an house in, that my name might be there. Neither chose I any man to be a ruler over my people Israel. This was the purpose of God. This was His will. For He is a God for all of humanity to worship. And so His words were not to be appointed to a certain nation, the gospel, to a specific nation alone. You may be confused by this time, my brother. For if these were the principles of God, having no selected church, selected nation, then why is it that there are a lot of accounts in the Holy Bible speaking about the temple of God, and that that temple is a man-made structure? Now, the history is broad, but God's reason is full of love. Now, let us read the history here in the book of Acts chapter 7, verse 38 and 39. It says, This is he that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel which spake to him in the Mount Sinai and with our fathers who received the lively oracles to give unto us, to whom our fathers would not obey, but thrust him from them, and in their hearts turned back again into Egypt. When they were in the wilderness, with no temple, no structure, God called his people a church. And when they have returned their hearts back to Egypt, they long for the ways of the pagans to become their own ways, especially in worshiping a God that has a dedicated temple for that God. God condescended, for He knew that it was the only way for this people to begin to understand His teachings again, for their minds were debased and lowered because of their slavery in Egypt for hundreds of years. But as God has made the temple a lesson book for the people to know His ways, it was not within God's original will to build a temple for His presence to dwell in. It was done in great love and consideration for a nation who loved God but had difficulty in comprehending the words of God in their time because of how debasing the pagan doctrines were that changed and influenced their lives. For our last text, let us read the declaration of God about the temple that was built by His people. Let us read here in Hosea chapter 8, verse 13 to 14. It says, They sacrifice flesh for the sacrifices of mine offerings, and eat it. For the Lord accepteth them not, now will he remember their iniquity and visit their sins. They shall return to Egypt. For Israel hath forgotten his maker and buildeth temples, and Judah hath multiplied fenced cities. But I will send a fire upon his cities, and it shall devour the palaces thereof. Stay with us in the next episode so that we would be able to understand the deep history of the great love of God to his people. Why is something that he does not will to do was allowed for his people to do? What was the reason to it? What made it necessary to be done? Those will be the next questions to be answered in the next episode, my brethren. As we end the study, let us bow our heads in prayer. Let us pray. Our Father in the heavens, you are the owner of our lives and the God that we serve. Amid the high and lofty heavens, we make this appeal for help in our lives. We have understood the great truths about your workings in this world, especially about the temple that you consider in this world. We have understood the devilish doctrine of erecting man-made temples that will debase the minds of the people. Help us with your great strength and grace to keep ourselves out of these man-made temples, but rather establish our individual selves as the temple of your choosing. Be it where we may be, we believe that you will be with us, for you are faithful to your words. Only bless this channel that has become an instrument for the words of truth to enter into the minds of the people of this world. And please forgive us for the sins that we have made against Thee in our words, thoughts, and acts, as we forgive those that have sinned against us. And all these things we surrender at the feet of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Right now, my brethren, God is calling for His people who love Him and will show this love to Him by the obedience of His commands and His call. He is making a plea for us to remove ourselves from these false teachings about 
worshiping inside these man-made structures and these man-made church buildings. He's calling you out the same. If you feel the need to know more, feel free to contact us through these platforms presented in our screen. And make sure to like, share, subscribe, comment down anything that you wish from your heart to be expressed and read by us. And all of these will be responded in kind consideration in the next topics. And once more, my brethren, may God's blessing rest upon you.